Good evening, all. Um, I'm almost sad to introduce this lecture because we've, we've had a very good series for the past few weeks, and this is the last of uh, four in asset management and uh, reliability. Before we go any further, uh, fire exit once again, out the door you just came in, or immediately behind you there in the corner. Mobile phones, please silence or power off. Um, and also, one request of you, please. There's attendance sheets out on the tall table outside there in the hallway. If you haven't signed on the way in, will you please sign on the way out? So at least the guys in Dublin will give us some credit for the attendance that we've got tonight. Um, there's a few interesting lectures. There's quite a lot of interesting lectures actually coming up over the next weeks and months. <coughs> Tomorrow night, there's a, a quirky one, if you will, with. Uh, the Institute of Structural Engineers. It's to do with theme park rides and the structural engineering aspect of those. Um, so that's that's quite interesting. Um, Irish Water, new connections, the unmentionable. Refurbishment of St. Patrick's Bridge. For those of you who are aspiring to achieve chartered engineer on the 6th, uh, that's tomorrow, tomorrow a fortnight, uh, there's an information evening on what you need to do to apply for a chartered engineer. And all of those and more are on the Engineers Ireland Cork website under the diary page and on the engineersireland.ie, the national website, on the events page. There's quite a few courses on asset management and reliability coming up as well over the next couple of months. And you can see more of that on the national website. Um, and so, to tonight's lecture um, on, on asset recapitalization. I suppose the speakers have been talking with us over the past couple of weeks about uh, put, you citing examples in their lectures because if you can put a context on something, it makes it more meaningful and, and, more, uh, and much more interesting. Tonight's speakers, and there are two of them, are going to put a, con a context of, on all of the work that we do because they're going to talk about the financial aspects of things, right? And let's face it, <laughs> that, that's what we serve. Uh, Connor Cooney, the first speaker, is a building services engineer, and he's a member of Engineers Ireland, the Institute of Asset Management, and the British Institute of Facilities Management. He's a facilities and asset management consultant at Arup, where he set up the asset and facilities management business for Arup Island, Ireland in 2003. We're also joined by Santo Leung, who has a background in engineering and corporate finance. He's an analyst in the advisory services team at Arup, and his work includes recapitalization programs, sinking funds, as well as cost benefit analysis. He's also involved with Arup's research and strategic foresight work exploring emerging trends and technologies such as wait for it, blockchain, and digital twins. So with that said, I'll hand you over to Connor. <coughs> thanks, Padraig. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming this evening. So, um, so this evening's uh, presentation, as Padraig quite rightly said, we just want to put more of a kind of a economic feel around actually why we're going to do a lot of the work that we do every day of the week. Um, so, recapitalization planning is kind of what we generally call it. It's otherwise known as sinking funds, and has a lot of other names also. Um, the presentation itself is kind of is a little kind of text heavy, but the intention is that you get to share this with you afterwards. So once you, know, you, know, you can email this out tomorrow so people can review it again afterwards. So just what I want to go through uh, in terms of contents, what is recapitalization? Um, the context of that within the asset management world where we can most of the sort here. Who uses it and why? When is it applied? How was it applied? And you use some useful standards and codes and guides around that then. And at the end of that then we're going to have a few case studies as well. Santa will be able to with, with, with that also. So what is recapitalization planning? I suppose well, one of the first issues I often find when discussing this is actually understanding, getting the, a common language. When you start talking to different departments, different, uh, different disciplines, financial, maintenance, capital, Everybody uses slightly different words for different, and have different meanings for that. For the purposes of this lecture or the presentation, I put up a number of definitions which have actually been taken from ISO standards and British standards. 
So ISO 41,011 is facilities management for Capillary, and ISO 55,000 the asset management series, uh, in addition to BS 8544. So these particular uh, definitions makes it quite clear for everybody as to what, what an asset is. So the asset, in this case, has to be the thing or entity that has potential or actual value to an organization. The ultimate reason why we're actually working there every day. Um, the performance, obviously, a measurable result. It can relate to either quantitative or qualitative uh, findings. And risk, then, is the effect of uncertainty. I'm not going to read all of those there. But at least by having this as a starting point, you can create discussions with colleagues even though they are from different disciplines. Where does recapitalization planning actually sit? Well, when you look at the entire whole life cost, it's well down to the I won't say the pecking order, but it's a sub, sub, subset of the overall costs for whole life costs. So when you look at under whole life costs, you get externalities. That could be like carbon footprinting, how much you know, carbon are we using to get lorry loads of concrete to a site to build a building. Non-construction costs could relate to the actual design teams and the income themselves is the revenue stream that's actually generated as a result of um, using these assets. The life cycle cost in self-explanatory here is split into different four more parts. Construction, operation, maintenance and end of life costs. End of life is actually something that's very often forgotten. And maintenance cost in here, you can see is split into two other categories, subcategories again. Renewal costs, as mentioned earlier, it does have a number of different names, and obviously the maintenance cost themselves. One of the reasons I like to kind of focus on the recapitalization planning is the impact it actually has over the entire life cycle of, a, of, of, a, of any assets. Um, what we can see here on the top diagram is capex and opex. So this is a, a generalization. So capex would typically be of the order of 33% over an asset life cycle, the remainder on, on, based on, on, on OPEX. That OPEX then is split into three forward categories, energy, maintenance, and life cycle replacements. So what can be seen here is, you know, for this particular in, instance was for HVAC equipment, 20% um, of the whole life cycle, or the, the whole life cycle cost of that asset is spent on refurbishing, replacing parts, or actually uh, replacing the entire asset itself. In terms of an actual kind of definition, what are the secret funds? I think the, the green text here is probably one of the better uh, definitions in this instance. A contingency fund is established by owners to provide for future capital improvements. So by having the funds available, you know it's going to happen, you have the fund, and uh, it's just part of the, the process planning as part of asset management. So the context of recapitalization planning within asset management. So asset management, as I mentioned over the last couple of weeks, is the balance of risk, cost, and performance, or health, as seen in the graphic here. By balancing these three items, it's, it's, a, it's forever you know, um, trying to find, the, you know, get, get the best within each of these constraints. The asset hierarchy then actually kind of defines what type of assets you want to maintain. An asset can start off as a bridge, but within a bridge then you obviously have different parts, you have the role itself, the structure, the tarmac, and you can break it down, break it down. So understanding the asset hierarchy of those assets themselves is hugely important. The intention of developing these recapitalization plans is to move from a reactive mode into a proactive mode. What we've seen over the last 10, 15 years is that um, People, as many people who work with are kind of firefighting, trying to resolve yesterday's problems. And they get so stuck in, into that space, they don't get the opportunity to plan forward. The intention here is to be kind of, uh, make, create that awareness whereby if you have the plans in place, you can actually make, make more informed decisions going forward. So within asset management, there are three layers typically. So strategic, tactical and operational. The operational is the level at which act the activities are actually performing in the government. In this case, you know, for life cycle analysis, it's the maintenance, execution, and resource allocation and enabling other activities uh, required for smooth asset operation. You can see it highlighted here on the green on the bottom right hand side. The next level then is tactical. So the level at which the organization plans and manages 
those specific mechanisms. In the context again of recapitalization planning, it's fulfilling asset life cycle planning and control requirements aimed at continuous asset availability. So for assets in, in our case, uh, the assets are typically core to the business needs. If the asset's not available, it means there's an interruption to revenue stream immediately. At the next level then is the strategic level, the level at which an organization defines its objectives, policies and plans. In this instance, life cycle uh, uh, cost and relates to providing an integrated view of the asset life cycle management information to facilitate strategic decision making at executive level. So part of our duties here, I suppose, within any organization is, is what we normally see is most people kind of operating at the tactical level. Uh, what, understand the benefits of recapitalization plans, but have to push that upwards then to the, uh, to the to CFOs, CEOs, and so on. So again, the context, ISO 55002 is the asset management standard, and the section said they are related to planning to achieve asset management objectives. So in this case, here, highlighted in green again, this is, it's common practice for such asset management plans to contain a rationale for asset management activities, operational plans, capital investment, and that includes overhaul, renewal, replacement, and enhancement, and financial and resource plans. So in order to gain any accreditation for uh, ISO 55000, one would need to have these plans in place. The following is just, um, <clears throat> this is, uh, this is what we can with interpretation, I suppose, of ISO 55000 and many other ISO standards that are out at the moment. So it takes on the Deming cycle of plan, do, check, and act. Um, 9001, 14001, all those other standards, they all have a very similar framework to this one as well. And this one also relates to asset management. And quite simply, you have the policy at the start, management strategy and objectives, one, moving on to your neighbors. After that, in section five, looking at the implementation of the plan itself and the performance in section six with an annual management review on an annual basis. How does recapitalization fit into this? What you can see here are highlights in green, specific areas where that recapitalization kicks in. So the strategy and objectives, as mentioned in the two slides previous, comes in as part of recapitalization as part of this. Contingency planning. If assets fail, you need to know that you have the funds available to put to um, replace those assets immediately or have a plan in place for that. Uh, 4.6 there is information management, having that information to understand that you can make that decision. Risk management, similar to contingency planning, understanding where it could fail, why it will fail, and when it does fail, what you're going to do to resolve that issue then. Number five, that one there, life cycle activities, well that's self-explanatory. Understanding the acquisition, the operation, the maintenance, and the disposal, the four life stages of any asset. 6.2 then is the investigation of asset related failures. Why are assets failing? Without understanding the failure of those assets and the source of those problems, we won't understand it, we won't be able to prevent it from recurring again. So, do these failures and investigations that need to happen as part of this process? And 6.5 then is improvement activities. Same with all of the other ISO standards. Continuous improvement forms a very important part of that. So who uses recapitalization planning and why? What we have here is a very varied, uh, varied um, range of disciplines and business sectors. Top left, you've got an office environment or trading floor. Uh, Top center, manufacturing, industrial, then we got roads, airport, ports, uh, gas networks, rail, water, data centers. In each of these examples, assets are hugely critical to the business needs. If the assets fail at any stage, it means business shuts down, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a loss of, loss of, revenue, loss of revenue stream. That impacts on business success. So on the left hand column here, we said who actually develops it? So what we, what we generally see is, this is generally driven by asset managers themselves, state directors, maintenance managers, and facilities managers, and so on. Why do you do this? Central column there, improved financial performance. 
managed risk, from the health and safety, environmental, or financial, and so on. It's important to understand that the risks associated with that asset recapitalization planning are not just associated with risk kind of around financial. There can be other drivers for that. If it's assets could potentially cause some injury or even debt, then in some cases that could be the main driver for the replacement of those assets. The performance of the assets is obviously crucial, particularly for those that are reaching their end of life. For the most part, people generally assume that assets are only placed at the end of life. And for slide forward, I will explain a bit more on that. Assurance here, assurance is a word that's becoming hugely popular. And I think the assurances for people to feel that they can, the assets that they have in place have a strong longevity of life remaining. And if they don't, that they have a backup system in place whereby they can replace those assets when they need to. Enhanced reputation. I think we're all familiar with uh, British Airways last year, where someone unplugged something out of a data centre. 120 million worth of reputational damage. Compliance and regulation. One of the main drivers, usually in the one, top two or three, we see with many of our clients, has been a driver for uh, asset management. Uh, improved financial performance, mentioned already, improved efficiency, obviously, and effectiveness, and informed decision making. That's one of the best benefits of this. By have planning this in for, for, forward, you're giving more, um, you know, uh, allowing your uh, colleagues to make more and better informed decisions as a result. Generally, when these, uh, these recapitalization plans are developed, they are for the C suite, the CEOs, CFOs, and so on, the building owners. They are the ones that will ultimately have to fork out. So in that case, then it's a case of building the business case around that. That's what the recapitalization plan is. It's a business case. This is an excerpt from uh, the State of Infrastructure Industry report that was developed last year by the Institute of Asset Management. Institute of Asset Management. So they did a survey, this is over, uh, over the UK, and it was just cross-business, cross-sector survey getting an understanding of kind of who's out there, who's doing what, and what's needed next. This is one of the questions that was put out there, which investments are going to be made within the next 12 months to help with asset management strategies. So at the very bottom, you see the highest number there is 38.3 percent is risk management and assessment. But specifically, you can see the two highlighted ones in white, life cycle modeling and costing, at 29.9% and asset investment planning to 27.1%. I think it's a little unusual that they can have these split because in effect you can't do one without the other. You wouldn't do the life cycle cost modeling unless you're actually going to do asset investment. You can't do the asset investment unless you have the life cycle modeling actually complete in the first place. So when is this generally applied? This is a short excerpt there from Part M guide from SIBS. So, uh, for life cycle considerations, there should be a planned approach to replace larger components and elements of building services of a five year program. I'm not sure why it's at a five year program. There's no reason why it can't be five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years even. I mean, many PPPs, the public private partnerships, have 30 year life, uh, life plans on those. Uh, as the performance and the costs required to keep them in service incrementally increase. Highlighted again below at the bottom of this is so informed decisions can be made on funding. Unless those figures are in place, people make poor decisions, not deliberately, but because they, do not, they don't have the information to help them make a better decision as a result. So the top right graphic there just gives a kind of, of an indication of cost profiles for different activities. Um, so the, the blue there is obviously the capex, the construction stage, the acquire and the, the, the acquire of the assets themselves. So you can see there's a lot of times an effort to put around planning and purchasing, the research of those actual assets themselves. And then it goes into the opex stage. That's where you know you get your maintenance activities and the maintenance maintenance costs. And as mentioned earlier, the renewal costs form part of those maintenance costs also. The building life or asset life generally as an example, can be somewhere between 30 to 50 years. So traditionally, people are just interested in the first two to three years. How much is it going to cost me to put, you know, buy a pump, to build a bridge, and whatever that might be, without taking into account the remaining 47 years. So the biggest impact over that can be achieved is actually at the OPEX stage rather than the 
uh, capex stage. If 75% of the entire life cycle cost is associated with the hopping stage, we take 10% off that at 7.5% as opposed to 10% off 25%. Drivers for asset replacements. <clears throat> so generally people just think asset end of life, okay, time to replace it. And that's the only reason you replace it. But there are many other reasons for having um, drivers for that. Health and safety and environmental risks. If an asset was deemed to, that it might fail before its end of life, or may have a catastrophic failure, like um, maybe a car park or something like that, might have structural damage, we said, let's get rid of this asset before it actually collapses and kills someone. Uh, consequences of failure, catastrophic or significant, just mentioned there. Technological advancements. The centre has an example here shortly where we looked at the theatre and some of the equipment that was in the theatre originally was no longer needed because there was so many different technological advancements in that space. Timing, access issues and planned shutdowns. We've seen assets where they're replaced simply because part of a building has been moved or there's, you know, the space has been opened up and they said, hey, this is a good time to actually take. While well, we're here, let's do this. Let's change out that air handling unit again because otherwise there's going to be 20, 20 grand associated with scaffolding or something like that. Planned shutdowns obviously more in the, in the farm industry. Um, good opportunity again for asset replacements rather than waiting for it to fail during the operations to fail. Excessive running costs is obviously a driver as well, be, uh, related to energy, but it can also be related to maintenance. If it's continually failing, then obviously it has a more a higher uh, maintenance cost associated with that. In addition, obviously, to the loss of revenue we can mention earlier. Increased productivity, well, that could be by person, product, or service, again, related to that asset. And it's also important to note that not always do you replace the entire asset, maybe just parts of the asset. So, how were these applied? So, this is just one example of how these could be applied. Uh, asset register is the first step. Understanding what you actually have. Defining when your estimated failure is. Uh, generating the asset replacement cost. How much does it cost to replace that entire asset? A criticality analysis then around you know what's the likelihood of a failure and the uh, consequences of that. Then you get a cost plan profile, some, something similar to that graph that we see down here below. And then there's the analysis for the budget. Obviously, that's the hard talk needed with the, the CFO saying, you know, this is what we need. This is the cash we need. What's it actually available? And lastly, then there's the optimized asset replacement. Just developing the actual cost plan itself is only part of the, of, of the entire problem. Understanding when to replace those assets is actually much more difficult doing that. We'll just go through each of those steps in a bit more detail. So in terms of the asset register, ultimately we need to define what's the asset hierarchy. So if we look at any kind of an asset set, we need to understand how does that form part of the, all the other assets within, around that as well. So even something like as simple as, um, as mentioned earlier, like the bridge, part of the bridge as far as the road, with the uh, expansion joints, with the railings, and so on and so on. Once we that, then we look at defining the, the asset groups. Um, for example, we looked at one there up there on Cock County Hall. So you said, you know, if we're placing the lighting, for example, we could do two floors every year. And by the time you get to the top, you start back down the bottom again. It makes in that, in that case, it was actually it seemed more uh, cost effective. Replace all the lights in each of those two floors rather than having a technician or an engineer going out replacing lights on a one by one basis. So it was planned and it was more effective in that regards. And then to understand to what level do you actually want to develop your uh, life cycle cost or recapitalization plan? Do you want to go down to component level? So for many, it's about developing what's appropriate for your needs. Next stage then is the estimated failure. So obviously I'm trying to understand you know, when was it was initially installed or built, put an estimation on that. Life expectancy references. There are numerous references out there for different asset types. Um, SIBSI mm. have some ASHRAE, RICS, and have those. It's important, there's a number of factors to take into consideration there. These different organizations actually can have different reference lives. 
So even though you know one might say a boil up 20 years, another might say a boil up might last 22 years for different reasons. So despite your best efforts to kind of keep it as accurate as possible, these are only estimations and they can vary from organization to organization. What's also important to know is the basis for that estimation. So in some cases, again, that um, might see pumps as a matter might, might last 10 years. In that case, 10 years based on what? Is that 24-7? Or... So generally, what those figures are based on is 12 hours a day, five days a week. If your pumps are running 24-7, then you're more than likely to have a half lifespan of that expected. That obviously creates a lot of issues then, people understanding uh, you know, why aren't they as reliable as we expected. Um, the asset condition then, uh, so ISO 15686 has brings in seven different factors. It's a bit of a more scientific approach into how you actually evaluate the assets and the condition of it itself. It looks at the original manufacturer was a high quality at the time. Uh, it looks at the, the design, was it a good design, was there any issues with it? It looks at the, the install quality itself, was it a high quality install? It looks at whether it was in an internal environment, whether it's clean, dry, or is it, can it could be in some like a, a, a solvent environment that might affect some of the, the parts on it. Um, it looks at the external environment, whereby it was near the sea or something like that, that you might have saw the air and it could start rusting parts earlier. Um, it also looks at the run hours and it looks at the maintenance activities around that. So within that ISO standard, it has these seven different factors and each normal is 1.0 and poor is 0.8 and uh, high rating is 1.2. You multiply those seven factors by the actual life expectancy itself of 20 years, you can generate a better idea then of how long that asset would actually live. So obviously if everything is going really well, you can increase the life expectancy of that as a simple calculation. Alternatives include um, the NHS in the UK has a simple 8E rating. It's a much more popular one. Uh, Bizrail used this one also. So A is brand new. B is uh, slightly degraded but still fully operational. C then is going it's as old as you'd expect it to be. And it has the same degradation. As it. D, obviously, it's more degraded than you would expect it to be for its age. And E then is it's obsolete or it's, uh, has failed or is about to fail. This then can actually prioritize some of the works and it can like, give you a, uh, an added insight as to the life expectancy within that. So by gathering that information, you have a much better idea of the estimated failure. The asset replacement cost. So it's much more than just the cost of the asset itself. You have to take the asset out, so it's the whole decommissioning. You might have to drain down systems, you might have to sh shut down electrics. Um, there's obviously the, the cost of the asset, the testing, the commissioning, and also the labor costs, but it's well, the time of hours. <coughs> What's important to note actually is some of the hidden costs. We came across when they are in a large chamber, a council chamber, where the replacement of the lights themselves was only, I think, like a thousand quid. But the scaffolding itself cost something like six thousand euro to put up. <laughs> so it was actually the, the, um, the costs, you know, those hidden costs need to be taken into account also when replacing these. Replacement cost doesn't generally include for the disposal, although I'm not quite sure why not, because it's part of the overall cost, someone has to pay for that disposal. Generally, it doesn't include for out of hours or testing of our infrastructure as a result of that. So that's the asset replacement cost. Criticality analysis, understanding which assets are critical. And Santos going to explain a spot a bit more about this shortly as well. But just to give you a quick insight, uh, the likelihood of failure, looking at kind of a one to five, we do a, a five by five matrix. So not going to head in safety with a scene before, I'm sure. So very unlikely. So more than 10 years before it's going to fail. Unlikely, fairly unlikely, it works its way down to very likely less than six months. Bizri again would use these kind of um, these metrics when they're actually developing these risk management profiles. The consequences again, one to five, these are, would be well, well known up to insignificant, no injury or downtime, we have in this instance here. Uh, two then is minor, first aid or some degree of downtime. All the way down to five, catastrophic, which can you know, be either death, cost or full downtime. Impacts straight away again on revenue streams.
By understanding these, we can create three different profiles of low, medium, and high uh, <coughs> um, risks against those. And it helps us better define and rationalize how best to you know, um, allocate resources around that. I've just generated a simple profile here, just, just here as a, a working example. So I put in the asset here, so I've given a complete different range of different assets from different sectors, air hand units, IT servers, baggage handling system, rail sleepers, and so on. Estimated failure. These are just estimated based on some of the criteria that we would have gathered to date, and a replacement cost against that. Now, in simple Excel sheets, you know, uh, we can use a sum if command. Simple command that goes, goes through, looks for this um, each of these criteria here, what year is actually uh, due to fail, and it actually adds up those individually to create a, a nice bar chart at the end of that. So we can see from this bar chart here, 2019, 20, 21, and there's a huge peak in and you know, heading for 200,000. Having this knowledge and being able to share that with the Chief Finance Officer or you know, perhaps just your, your board is hugely powerful. It gives them the foresight to be able to plan for that ahead. It also means that you get a lot of more kudos and respect because now you have helped them to plan something that you know is going to happen. And they have contingency plans in place to actually be able to mitigate those as well. Next one then is the analysis versus the budgets. So that's outlining the risks and responsibilities. Someone asked me there recently about changing uh, uh, statutory compliance checks from four down to three per year. And I said, well, why would you do that? And I said, uh, well, we don't have the money for extra resources. I said, well, I said, in that case, the issue needs to be you know, go back up again and inform those that are responsible that they are obliged to put those resources in place. So that's why I mentioned this here. Making others aware of their responsibilities. You, have, you can only bring your responsibilities so far. If someone else is holding the purse strings and doesn't release that cash for various different reasons, um, then the level of responsibility actually you know, goes to the next stage uh, then. Creating the 10 or 20, oops, sorry, 10, 20 year capital expenditure plan. So as mentioned before, you know, generally we see these going to have been developed for about 10 years, but there's no reason why you can't go for 20 or 30 years. We did one recently for 30 years. Um, that gives more kind of a surety, it gives greater insight. And but also when developing the 30 year plan. If you're doing that, you, you get to see a number of different replacements. So fan coil units might be replaced say, every 10 years. So even though you're replacing one in year 29, you still need the cash to put aside for year 31, 32, and 33. So it's important to take into consideration that when you're developing these plans, you look beyond the actual profile of the end of that. So, um, so yeah, so if, if we're doing a 20 year plan, it's worked actually developing the plan up to year 25 and beyond because sometimes there's a particular spike in that period and you need to take those costs into account also. Building the business case for additional funding. So this is actually say, okay, we've gone out, we've done a condition survey of all the assets. This is the condition of them. Some are good, some are bad. These are the costs or uh, estimates for the replacement. Uh, these are what we can define as the low, medium and high risk items based around that. And you have that conversation then around, okay, well, you know, what's the budget available uh, for that? And from that, then we develop the annual recovery rate. So the annual recovery rate isn't quite, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like an average, it's not quite an average. It's the minimum amount to be put away on an, on a, on a annual basis. So in this case, if we go back to a previous slide, and we have 15,000 here, another 35, and you accumulate those up, if we only put away 20,000 every year, we'd be okay for the first three years, but we'd be very short in for year four here, 2022. So what needs to be put away is the summation of the four rows, or get over that peak, and then we can actually drop the actual annual recovery rate in, in 2023 to something more reasonable. So it's important that you identify where those peaks are on these graphs. That's the, 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 the benefit of having these visually also. And that's calculating the annual recovery rate. There's a formula here on the left hand side. I won't go into it in too much detail now, but just looks at the, uh, the annual interest rates and the life period for those. 
Lastly, then looking at the optimized uh, asset replacement program. So once they actually you've got the funding, how do you actually replace the assets in between? So it's not a case of going out, okay, I've got the money and we're gonna replace exactly everything that was pops up. Typically, you're either gonna wait for failure and you have this, you know, the, the assets in place, or you have some form of plan that you, you know, that you can get, get those assets either on a shutdown, but at least it's planned and it's optimized in, in that regards. What you see in this graph here is and on the red line is the operations and maintenance risk costs around that. The green line, obviously the replacement costs. It's like having your car at home. You have the car, it's going a couple of years, all of a sudden you're paying a bit more to fix this, a bit more to fix that. You know, the clutch is gone, another 500 quid. At some stage you have to make a decision that this cost this car is costing me more than if we're going out and actually get a new car again or a replacement car. So where is that sweet spot? To me? So in this case, it's the summation of these two curves. It's the bottom of that curve. It's the, it's the sweet spot in this case, the optimal point for replacement. When it gets to that point, that's when you should be actually replacing those. Now this, you can't do this for kind of a whole group. So what would typically would happen is for the higher value assets or the more critical assets, you would go back to those and you would understand. You would do an individual assessment for each of those or groups of those. So maybe something like the lighting I mentioned earlier, that you could group with, uh, you know, maybe 20, 20, 40,000 euro for a whole set of lights or flows of lights. Um, this is about, uh, yeah, understanding the total cost of ownership, I suppose, uh, the replacement. Software packages are out there at the moment. This help actually we're kind of deal with this. You can obviously do the Excel sheets, you can, you can do that. Uh, Salvo is one particular software out there. Uh, um, it's uh, developed by the Woodhouse Partnership. So some of those guys could be involved, John Willows himself was involved in developing the ISO 55000 asset management system. So, so I suppose this is just uh, one way of undertaking the exercise and it's probably a more simplistic way. It can get much more complex. Um, the level of detail needs to be appropriate to the level of risk also and to the needs. Generally we find that that mechanism itself is uh, serves its purpose, shall we say. We don't need to go into that kind of huge level of details about other complexities and economics around that. Uh, PPPs and PFIs, obviously we need to go to a much greater level of accuracy around that, quite simply because they need to know and understand what their operational costs are going to be over the period of 30 years. How often will we need to replace you know, different parts of and different assets? It needs to be defined and understood in detail. If they can find a means by which they can sweat the assets, you know, let's give them a fanta unit working from 10 and push it out to 15 years. We've now cut the replacement, um, uh, the replacement of those from three down to two times. So there's a 30% you know, saving on that immediately. Other complexities that I haven't mentioned here, it could be a whole other presentation on net present value, discounted cash flow, inflation, deflation, depreciation, and partial investments. The net present value is, okay, if it is a sinking fund and it's going to go on for 30 years, well, the cash that I have today won't buy me the same things today with that I can in 30 years' time. So it looks at, okay, how do we add inflation to that? What's the depreciation of the assets over that period of time? And we take those costs into account and build that up over the period of that. Uh, uh, so in simple terms, it's adding on the inflation, and then it's the inflation on the inflation, and it becomes cumulative over that period of time. Some useful standards and codes around this thing. So there's quite a number of them there. But I find the Bizarre document here, BG67, uh, is particularly good. Uh, life cycle costing. Bizarre documents generally are very simplistic. They bring it down, nice graphs. It isn't overly heavy on text and gives good, good working examples also. Um, there's numerous other documents, as you can see there. There's British, you know, BS standards. EN standards, ISO standards, and so on. And it depends again as to the level of detail that you want to go into. The petroleum and uh, natural gas industry there has a very specific methodology there also, very specific in, in that regards. The ISO 686 I mentioned earlier, that's where the one that has the seven different factors that takes into consideration. So they're worth reviewing as well. Simple case studies. Um, I'm just going to go on two quick ones before I sent up. So, uh, Paul Finnerty is a good coffee council. 
So over the three stages, over 15 years, they invested about 100 million in building stock around Cork County Hall campus. And obviously they realized that they had major infrastructure at various different stages of maturity. So they knew that um, different parts of the building were going to expire for different reasons at different stages. Uh, and also they would require a serious capital investment. So developed the asset register, went through the process as we had mentioned there earlier, and uh, identified the end of the indicative end of life. Uh, that report was presented to their senior management and had a capital replacement plan for 10 years. As you can see here then, uh, they were seen as having a very proactive and practical approach from a capital planning standpoint and received increased capital funding budget of 150 grand annually. Now, that was money that I suppose originally hadn't got, but as a result, you know, a simple enough exercise made a dramatic difference to his budget in the first year alone, he was able to replace the three lifts that were coming to hell. had been hugely problematic for him over, over a 10 year period. Lastly, it also makes capital budget planning very easy to submit annually as a replacement cost of assets are identified in the report for a 10 year period. So having that information means just extract those fixtures, plans, worked well. This was only in the Irish Times, so only last Wednesday, by coincidence. Um, so the vast majority of apartments need bigger sinking funds. Could, we've been involved with numerous district heating systems over the last five, ten years, and has amazed me the amount of uh, these muds, these multi-use developments that do not have sinking funds in place. So you have large biomass boilers or heating systems and all the other infrastructure that goes around to looking after uh, multi-sites or multi-use sites. When these fail, neither the property managers, neither the landlord, neither the management company that actually operates the entire block of residential and retail, they don't have the funds in place when this go. So it's not going to be a good scenario when that actually comes around and someone goes looking for 100 or 200 grand to pay for these replacements. And this is inevitable at this stage. Some of the concerns that they actually had here. Uh, the standard of property will reduce, residents living standards will fall, and our health and safety may even be compromised. On a more unfortunate basis then, if you're probably familiar with obviously the, the bridge collapse in Genoa, uh, the financial facts behind the fury. This is printed by writers themselves. Of course there's numerous you know, uh, ministers and other uh, deputy prime ministers go straight to the EU saying oh, our funding was cut. During an initial investigation, they found that the total investment and maintenance spending on Italian and transport fell by 58% between 2008 and 2015. That has been identified as one of, one of the key contributors to the collapse of that actual bridge itself because funding was actually pulled. Had they identified what the funding was needed beforehand or plans were put in place, it is possible that, that this may not have happened. It's an unfortunate uh, outcome in this particular case. So I'm going to hand over to Santa now, and he's going to give a presentation on another point. Thanks, Thanks Connor. I'm just going to switch over that one. Right. Um, so I'm going to do a case study here on a theatre, so hopefully this will actually apply a lot of the steps that Connor was talking about. Um, um, so it's a theatre, um, and it's a capital replacement program or a sinking fund. Um, in this case, our client was a finance director um, for a, a real estate investor. Um, so we're calling it the capitalization plan, but it is a, it's more or less a sinking fund. Um, it is a large theatre, it was completed in 2010. Um, and you know, at this stage, when we started the project, it was getting to seven years of age, getting towards 10 years of age. So the scope and the cost of maintenance um, is going to increase as, as the theatre gets older. <coughs> and um, you know, the finance director identified 
that they're going to need um, a strategic plan in place to you know, work out how much money they need to set aside for the future years for the maintenance of this particular theatre. And they actually had a, a particular request that they don't want their um, own assets to depreciate. So on, from the onset, they're, they're investing into getting this sort of a study done because they don't want, the, you know, if they want to sell it in you know, 10, 15 years time, they don't want the asset to depreciate. So that's one of their goals and the drivers behind setting up um, a strategic uh, sinking fund. So I'll go through the uh, methodology that um, I went through to calculate it. So first step was a desktop review of the asset register. Um, very important uh, starting point to, for this process. Um, you, need, you need to know what assets you have in a, in, in a building context. Um, we were lucky that uh, Arif was involved in the design part of it, so it wasn't too hard to locate. Um, we had a very thorough asset register, um, but you know, if if you're starting from scratch without an asset register, um, you might have to go and do a survey, and of course, there's you know discrepancies. It it's, might not be as accurate as having the full asset register. Um, we also find that um, a safety file, a building safety file, is a good starting point if you really have nothing and it's also good to cross reference with an asset register from either your FM provider or um, the facility manager on site. Um, we then uh, reviewed with our disciplines so our remit um, covered mechanical and electrical uh, assets, facades and also the specialist acoustic equipment in this particular theatre that was a really significant concern is the specialist theatre equipment within the theatre um, so, you know, we, I'm a generalist, you know, a more finance background, you know, all these technical details with m and &E, facades and acoustics, I had to seek internal expertise with an Arab uh, to verify the assets and they were, um, you know, they were listing out the, the sort of systems which were obsolete, uh, systems which are no longer manufactured, uh, they need proper replacement, you know, things like, um, the lighting on the stage, probably uh, 2010, it was still uh, incandescent technology or fluorescent bulbs, and now these days it's all LED. So uh, we had to get expert uh, technical advice on the replacement of the assets and what systems are like for like. Um, and then crucially, we um, went down and actually sat down with the asset manager for a day. I actually went up twice, so once with the facilities manager on site and once with the this particular acoustic um, and theatre equipment specialist that they had on site. Um, that was really critical to understand the performance of the assets. Um, you know, like Connor said before, uh, when we have uh, reference benchmarks for asset life expectancies, they are for nine to five typical office environments. This is a theatre, you know, different operating environments. At best, it is maybe four hours a day in the evening, six to 10 p.m. for a performance, and maybe sometimes on a weekend to load uh, stage equipment and offload stage equipment. So we sat down with the facilities manager and we really had to alter quite a lot of the service life of the equipment, more mostly to extend, but also they had some problems with um, some assets which were failing before life expectancy due to poor workmanship or poor quality of materials to begin with. Um, it's getting that insight that really does shape um, the sinking fund so we get more accurate life expectancies and more accurate costs. Um, so after all of that, we have you know, a clear idea of the systems that need to be replaced, uh, the life expectancies, um, and then it came down to getting the costs and again, uh, going internally with um, quantity surveyors within our um, approximate estimations, I mean, better than, you know, just looking for, at me looking at a guide. Um, but still maybe not 100% accurate, you know, this whole exercise is, is estimation um, to a degree, but um, with the QS we were able to get some, some figures. Um, and then we went through a process of going through the criticality of each asset and assigning the risk with the um, five by five matrix that Connor mentioned. And then uh, we profiled the, the capitalization that was required and I'll go through that in, in further slides and then finally, just to give the client a bit of confidence, we did a sensitivity analysis using Monte Carlo simulation. So this next slide um, demonstrates the risk. 
profile with the risk uh, criticality assessment. Um, so, you know, like Connor said before, we have um, a ranking for a consequence of failure, one to five, five being catastrophic failure, um, and one you know, not so uh, significant. And then the likelihood of failure, uh, a rare failure in this context, in greater than 10 years up to definite failure, so something that's going to fail within six months. And then timesing those two rankings together, we get um, a risk ranking. One to seven is low risk, eight to 30 medium, and 14 to 25 being high risk. This next slide here um, demonstrates uh, the number of assets according to the risk. So um, you know, green here is you know, your assets which have a low risk ranking, and um, red here, assets with high risk ranking. So this gives a snapshot to the client and if, if they had quite a lot of you know, a high bar in the red area, immediate action might be required. They might need some immediate funds, spend a bit of money fixing something. Um, and then it depends on the risk appetite of the client. You know, they might choose to address in the situations more in the yellow and the orange region. Or if they really have um, quite a lot of funds at hand, a lot of resources, they can aim to um, you know, cater for everything and go into the green range. And this next slide here um, looks a bit like a stock graph, but if not, it's um, it's the uh, profile. Um, so Connor mentioned before, you accumulate all the um, the total amounts of replacement that you need, um, and instead of just doing a, an average yeah, each year of how much money you need, you know, say 5,000, 10,000, whatever, um, what this process did was we were trying to work out the least amount of money you need to meet each of the peaks. So you see here, you know, you put in aside, I think in this case, maybe three or four hundred thousand a year. You put in every year that amount, um, and each year all the dips are where you're spending. So you're spending, but you're putting money in at the same time, um, just to meet this peak. So using, you know, a solver, Excel solver uh, technique, you can work out the minimum amount you need to reach this exact peak here. And once you reach the peak, you can have another evaluation and you look again and you say from you know, 2033 onwards, my peak, my next peak is a bit lower, my, uh, the annual amount that I should be putting in to uh, reach that, the, to make sure I'm covered for that peak is a bit lower. And so it's a, a solve a, a iterative process and you sort of get a few band ranges of, of figures um, out into the future. And just the three colors there are um, the different types of assets um, at the risk level. So uh, the blue would cover all risks. And this is your um, ideal scenario if you had all the resources. Um, and then maybe a more likely situation would be the orange where you aim for the medium. So again, at the same time, you're putting aside quite a lot less money um, each, each year until you hit the peaks and you remodel. So you have a lower peak. Um, further on. And then finally, um, the Monte Carlo simulation. So here's a software package that um, allowed us to model, uh, put all our asset failures into a, a statistical model, in this case a triangle distribution. Um, and uh, for each, we did 10,000 iterations, and each iteration actually simulated um, a different set of assets failing at different years. So say if you had a boiler, your reference life is 10 years, 15 years before failure. Uh, we have a, a threshold, give or take negative five or plus five years. And then each simulation, uh, the boiler would fail at a different year. So it could fail five years before, four years before, up until five years after. And this is just to give the client a bit of confidence um, of, of the range of costs that they might incur because, you know, the asset failures aren't an exact science. It, it could fail at particular years, and it, you know, if you had a really bad year, all your expensive assets could fail at the same time, or you know, uh, you have a good year and nothing fails. So um, this profile here, um, the green area shows uh, the range for which the potentially your cost could be. Uh, the blue line shows your average, your median, and your the pink line there is that is the minimum. So really, the client would be you know, you'd want to have an idea of what you know a disastrous year in terms of asset value could be. Um, so that that gives you your 95% confidence there.
So uh, that sort of summarizes a, an example of applying that process that, that Hannah was speaking before about um, uh, working out a sinking fund for a building in this case. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you. <laughs>
I think you know, there's just different drivers for these change, for these replacements. And therefore, despite your best efforts today, you know, tomorrow we bring a whole new set of different challenges and different drivers. Every business changes, um, the, the pumps are just going to be all right tomorrow. The fact that they have decided to replace the pumps on the basis of uh, energy economics, as opposed to that they were defunct, um, you know, makes good business sense in that regard. So, so had they, know, they, they probably didn't know that two years ago or three years ago. So for that reason, then you know, I suppose the plan in itself is actually ever, ever evolving. You know, whether you decide to keep that up, probably a lot of work actually involved in trying to keep that up to date. So maybe it's just easier to do which every five years or thought at least. You know. Do you see well, the fact the fact is, was up to two years ago. We, you know, there's only there's only one other client that asked for one. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so I don't mean to be kind of spammed, but um, it's a, you know people just haven't kind of got around to that way, way of thinking. It's only in the last few years that people are starting to have this long term vision of what they need in terms of asset management. You know, even there was a very good point made there last week actually at the the BIM uh, session where someone said these are coming from different cost centers. So you have one is operational, and you have the other one is maintenance, and another one is you know, production, or whatever. You have all this capital planning. So the capital planning people say, well, look, you know, as long as you know, I get money for the cheapest operation, they want something different. And, you know, that's where if you have an overarching kind of you know estate director or whatever that is that has full vision of all of the costs and can make a decision. We we did a very simple we did an exercise uh, with a. Uh, a multinational a few years back on chiller replacement, and one chiller was costing I think, 150, and another was 200 grand. So that's right, along those figures. But we looked at the the whole life economics of that, what were the replacement parts, what were the energy costs, and what were the refurbishment parts of it. And the one that was more expensive in terms of capital was actually going to make a 20% saving of the whole recycling cost of it. So it was a good, you know, a valuable exercise in that regards because you know, we looked at you know the whole picture as opposed to just kind of the immediate time. I suppose that's the kind of message we're trying to get out here is that you know if we can look at kind of 10, 20 years, we can be far more economical as a result of that. Well, I'm just wondering now how um, I mean, the budget are doing in terms of what the need is or what the need is for the people that need to be paid. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, um, in terms of, uh, I would have talked to the US, you know, something they were doing. John mentioned last week in terms of reliability engineering, the US Army and NASA have been doing this since the 50s and the 60s, you know, looking ahead. The UK, I would say, is def definitely up there at the top. I mean, they are one of the drivers behind by ISO 55000, you know, the Woodhouse Partnership, John Woodhouse and all those, uh, were well involved in that. Um, in Europe, I think kind of what, Netherlands, Germany, certainly seems to be going to be much stronger than the other countries. Uh, in infrastructure, actually, the southern hemisphere seems to be quite involved. Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, to a lesser extent. And kind of going on, you know, presentations and publications that I would see being, you know, going on through LinkedIn. You know, you see the amount of activity that's happening. So certainly, um, infrastructure seems to be very strong in you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand. So. No questions. Place I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the input that the speakers over the past four weeks um, have made to this program of lectures. Uh, we have three of the four, uh, four or five, excuse me, from three, three or four events. We've uh, Jim Kelly in the room from, from the Who Let Us Out Well at the start, and we've John McCarthy from last week, and then Connor and Santo from tonight. This series of four wouldn't have been possible without the input of the guys, not just in their own individual uh, lectures and presentations, but also in shaping the course, maybe uh, two or three months before that again. right? So I'd just like if you would just show your appreciation for both for the speakers that were here tonight and uh, also for the others that are in the room. So thank you very much to all. <laughs>
and bank holiday and all the rest of that. And then we resume again on the 6th of November with a uh, talk for those who are aspiring chartered engineers. Uh, so look forward to seeing you again. Thanks again.